Excellencies, uh, inhabitants and friends of the Arctic, uh, I am delighted to be back on the land of the Inuit, our brothers and sisters in this part of the world. I'm also delighted to be back in Nuuk to take part in this very important uh, conference. I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting and specifically the government of Greenman Greenland for supporting my travel here. My point of departure is reindeer herding. Uh, hopefully that will have a wider uh, relevance uh, as well. Uh, I will be addressing business and policy together within the context of Arctic change. And I have some PowerPoints. I might have to turn my head a bit. Sorry about that. Uh, this map shows the reindeer herding areas in the world, 24 indigenous uh, peoples in all, spread across 10 national states, Greenland being one of them. Uh, close to 100,000 people altogether, if we count everyone. And on the one hand, one might say that that is a small number of people if we look uh, at the global context. If we turn it around and say that, look at it as an industry, uh, then we would have, how to say, close to 100,000 employees. So suddenly it is not uh, as small anymore. Certainly it is not a small livelihood in the Arctic, uh, being representing one of the largest users of the Arctic landmass. And it is, of course, our reindeer, uh, an Arctic living resource, between two to three and a half million uh, reindeer the last decades. In addition, we would have wild reindeer, and it is a typical indigenous livelihood, or perhaps even livelihoods, as our peoples are following a wide range diversity of different traditional activities, such as hunting, fishing, uh, gathering, and so on. And it is still uh, organized. Its basic model is quite similar everywhere it's found, uh, leading us to the thought that it is a model for management of these barren Arctic and subarctic areas. One point that I need to make is that there are fundamental differences between reindeer herding and agriculture. Typically, reindeer herding is managed uh, from the point of view of, of agricultural models. And this is a challenging from a policy point of view, as if the only tool you have is a hammer, pretty soon all problems start to look like nails. Uh, we could contrast the difference between agriculture and, and reindeer herding, pastoralism, in the following way. If you are into agriculture, what you do is to try to control the animals at any given time. In the case of reindeer herders, it's the opposite. We follow the reindeer not the other way around. Uh, and so uh, this, this is a fundamental difference uh, in, in the systems that, uh, that we, are, we are talking about. If anything, I would compare instead reindeer herding with uh, fishing. We have a lot of uh, gentlemen from the uh, fishing industry here showing you a, a graph of uh, the, the cyclicality of reindeer numbers in Sweden. Um, there are also uh, no word for stability in the Sami language. And so we do know a few things about uh, change. And indeed, the world is changing. Uh, the Arctic, despite recent setbacks, is very quickly becoming an integrated part of global economy. That, in combination with climate change, socioeconomic change, political change, uh, makes for an unprecedented uh, challenging situation for our communities. And as we are uh, seeing an explosion of policy, research, and development agendas in the Arctic, the fact remains that those who are most dependent on nature are also most vulnerable when that nature change. On the other hand, change means both possibilities and, and challenges. Uh, our peoples, though, often find themselves in a situation where we are not in a position to exploit the possibilities of a changing Arctic due to the fact that there are a lot of uh, negative pressures, as was mentioned uh, by earlier speakers. 
And, but still, we would like to also focus on the opportunities from an internal perspective. And this is important, not least for our youth. This is the backdrop for <clears throat> a new project that we have uh, endorsed in the Arctic Council, uh, co-led by uh, Canada, Denmark, Greenland, uh, Norway, Russia, USA, the Aleuts and Sami Council, uh, where we are working to uh, facilitate education, facilitate documentation of traditional knowledge, providing mechanisms for youth who want to be entrepreneurs. And I figured I would share some of the thinking around this project. And to do that, why don't we start with some economic history? The question of what made Great Britain great? Um, and I'm sure there are many answers. Uh, mine is this. England before the 1500 was based, its economy was much based on wool production. And it was exported and produced into textiles in the continent. Along came the Tudor clan with their Tudor plan, so to speak. Uh, started with Henry VII and gaining its uh, maximum, we could say, under Queen Elizabeth, in which one imposed a ban on exports, actually uh, capital punishment for those who exported illegally, uh, export taxes, protectionism, in order to industrialize their own production. And this laid the basis for the development then of uh, England. And someone has said that there are two criteria for colonies. One of them is that colonies are not allowed to uh, produce or to industrialize their own raw materials. In this case, uh, this principle was applied in reverse. For those who are especially interested, I could recommend this book by a professor we know. Um, we don't have time to go further. Now, to contrast this, uh, one could argue that this is the opposite has in fact happened in Norway, to bring that up as an example, where for 40 years we've had a, a, a regime in place that has established a purchase monopoly, or monopsony as it's called, uh, where we would have a, a, a quite a severe um, uh, concentration of power in the food chain in the slaughtering, uh, um, uh, uh, sl slaughtering sector. And furthermore, uh, marketing has been handed over politically, not by market forces, but handed over politically to the meat monopoly of Norway, which to many reindeer is, is as smart as Pepsi-Cola asking Coca-Cola to market and sell their products. Uh, and this has um, been uh, quite severe. The price, as you can see here, to producers was cut in half in 15 years. Uh, while the costs increased, um, it has been a period which has broken the backbone of the economy of reindeer husbandry in Norway, to bring that out as one example. We find parallels to this in Russia, where we've had the collectivization, forced collectivization. Uh, some of the same mechanisms are at play there. This is not the best uh, climate for entrepreneurship. So what options do we have then? <clears throat> uh, we need to focus on how much we get out of each single animal. And experience shows that increasing value added uh, from uh, reindeer products is fairly easy. What is challenging is to do it in a way that also benefit uh, primary producers. And there are many reasons uh, for this. Uh, at another point in time, I might be able to elaborate. I have to continue. So what are the answers? Well, what is the way ahead? I think no one has an answer, but not the full answer, but the part of it has to be this. We have to use the knowledge of our own people to develop our own societies. And since we are talking about a global Arctic, why don't we be inspired by the non-Arctic world as well? I've drawn up a few, a couple of examples from Italy. These are two of the stars of the culinary night sky, if we could say it like that, Parma ham and Parmesan cheese. What is interesting here 
is that uh, these are traditional products revitalized for modern markets. And it's done by small scale producers working together and competing in networks. Uh, and indeed, Arctic food resources are special and we do have some potential. Uh, and the knowledge, the culinary traditions of all the indigenous peoples is not used enough, not used appropriately. It's a win for all. Think about how it links to tourism, for instance. It's sustainable. I think, I guess no one comes to Nuuk to eat uh, chicken wings, right? Um, and to further this work, we have constructed something we call the Arctic Indigenous Peoples Culinary Institute to lift the focus on the food resources and the food culture of Arctic Indigenous peoples, engaging institutions in research, education, documentation of traditional knowledge. Our point of departure is our own tradition, a very strong tradition to use everything. That is a lesson for the world. Uh, and also, what can we get out of the resources we have? You have to start with what you have. With this work, we're trying to connect spheres that are usually not as well connected. Uh, business and academia, to connect traditional knowledge uh, with science, and to, uh, to connect the traditional with the modern or, or new. Some final observations. Uh, we need to have a focus on innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, and we have to do this, these things ourselves. Decolonization also means to add value to our own uh, raw materials, our own products, and it means to take back entrepreneurship, our own Tudor plan, if you will. Besides, contact with end users is a uh, key factor for development of any industry. I'm sure many can attest to this uh, in this panel. And we also need to focus on the development on our own premises, our own knowledge and our own people. Empowerment was a word used. We need also economical, economic empowerment of our youth. We have the knowledge, we have the products, and we have the best stories to go along with them. And so therefore, the market could, if able to work, uh, be also Ranger Herder's best friend. So Arctic change is on our horizon. Therefore, we need economic development. But what kind? We also need economic development of, by, and for the indigenous societies in the Arctic. Economic freedom of reindeer herders is, is a key factor to avoid vulnerability. We need to have the opportunities of a changing Arctic be opportunities for all. Thank you. <laughs>